Hey everybody, it's Gamadex, and welcome back to another premiere draft of Core Set 2021. Let's just get right into the draft and see what we open. Alright, let's see what we have in rares and uncommon as usual. 2 mana for a 2 1 flash. When it enters the battlefield, return a creature you control to its owner's hand and gain life equal to its toughness. For 3 mana, you can tap her to discard a legendary card and draw 2 cards. This does not seem all that good. With a bunch of good enter the battlefield effects, though, she could combo well, as well as gaining, gaining you some life and giving you some defense against removal spells. So interesting card. I might try her out. Uh, our uncommons are not that great. Definitely not like first pickable. I don't think Canopy Stalker's all that good. Trader's Greed, you want to be in a deck with good sacrifice outlets so that you can steal your opponent's creature and then sacrifice it before you give it back. And Unsubstantiate just seems okay. And our commons are pretty decent. I guess Mistral Singer or Scorching Dragonfire might be the pick here over Niambi because she is two color and not a huge payoff. I guess Scorching Dragonfire is probably the best and least restrictive card in this pack, so I should probably hop onto that bandwagon. And that may have been the right pick, because here's another Scorching Dragonfire, so we can just continue with that train. Just stick to red removal spells that are quite powerful for their mana cost. Just two mana, instant speed, three damage to a creature or planeswalker, and you get to exile it if it dies. So that seems pretty sweet. I like Hunter's Edge a lot as well. If you remember Prey Upon from previous draft formats, that was a four mana sorcery. You put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature and then it fights something. This is even better than that. And Prey Upon was pretty good. This, you put the counter on your creature and then just deal damage equal to your power. So your creature is 100% safe. Uh, this card is just really good as well. But I'll stick to our first color, grab another Scorching Dragonfire. That way we're open to what colors are open. Dire Fleet Warmonger is worth considering if we want to hop in on a strategy right now, but usually it's best to try to stay open as long as possible and see what starts wheeling. There's a lot of green stuff in this pack. I don't think Azusa is very good in limited. She's three mana for a 1-2 and you can play two additional lands on each of your turns, but in limited you don't have a whole lot of card draw so you're pretty often just going to play Azusa and only have like one more land in your hand anyway so you're getting like one additional land drop off her period just all game long so not that great for that reason. I do think Bone Pit Brute is a decent top end of a curve so we could take that to still stay open um, which I like that a little bit it does look like green with a Gnarled Sage and Pride Malkin these are both decent cards. Snare Spinner's fine too. I like Gnarled Sage the best out of these three, but yeah, it does look like green is mildly open here with all this stuff, but same with blue with an Opt and a Jeskai Elder and a Frost Breath here. So I'm just going to take Bone Pit Brute and let's see, see which is more open here. And now it's all black cards, so that's super weird. <laughs> I think because of that, I have no idea what's going on and I'd like to still stay open as long as possible. We have two really nice red cards in this pack. Chandra's Magmut, probably my favorite two mana common creature in red. It's a 2-2, and if you get to a position where you can't attack with it anymore, it's just a board stall. All your creatures are staring at each other. This gives you a way to kill your opponent without having to go into combat. There's no real way to stop it from just tapping and damaging them. Uh, and then Pitch Burn Devils is fine. 5 mana for a 3-3. Three, three. It trades up into something with 6 toughness, or you can block one of their things with like 3 toughness and then kill another thing with 3 or less toughness, so it can 2 for 1 pretty well. So it's a pretty nice card, but it's just a lot more expensive. I like to pick up as many Magmuts as I can. It's just a premier 2-drop. Another pack, all of the stuff in the other colors are not that good. Witch's Cauldron is nice in red-black. Red-black is the strategy for this. Red-black sacrifice, obviously, so maybe we could move in on the Witch's Cauldron here. But Chandra's Pyreling, not a whole lot of good most of the time. There's not a lot of stuff that combos with it super well, but... Chandra's Magmut is what makes the Pyreling pretty playable. If you can get like three Chandra's Magmut, then having a Pyreling or two in your deck is actually pretty powerful because you can use Magmut's ability to deal damage to your opponent and then Pyreling will get plus one plus zero and 
double strike to just do a lot of damage very quickly. There is another Pyreling if I really want to go in on that. Another pack where I'm not very excited by the other colors, so I may as well. And now we can take a Sure Strike. Having pump spells to go with your double strikers is quite powerful because this will basically give an extra 6 power instead of 3 power if you use it on a double strike creature. And we can really cut the red out of these packs so that the person that we're passing to on our left, uh, Jean Latuit, uh, knows that... <laughs> Red is not open. Uh, and I do like Battle Rattle Shaman a whole lot, so I'm not I'm not really missing out on anything in other colors by taking Battle Rattle Shaman. I think that would be just my favorite card in that pack in general in the first place. So now we're definitely taking something in another color. I like Valorous Steed a lot, and I think Canopy Stalker's okay. I do think Valorous Steed is probably my favorite card out of all these. I don't really like... Uh, Duress in Limited, I don't like Prismite at all. Alchemist Gift is an okay little pump spell, but it's definitely between the creatures here. And I like Valor Steed a little better. I just like spreading out five power among two creatures for your five mana. And it does look like Dire Fleet Warmonger wield all the way across the table, which means that the Red Black Sacrifice deck is most likely open because uh, no one chose to take this card. No one chose to signal to the rest of the table that they're going for red-black. So, maybe we move into red-black here. We'll see. I'm definitely going to take black cards over green or blue, but if I get a pack that has some good white cards and black cards in it, that's when I might be getting a little, little concerned and a little unsure of what to take. But, I mean, we're definitely just getting good black cards now. Walking Corpse is fine. Rise Again can be good. There is kind of a reanimator strategy in blue-black. Um, I guess red-black we'd really want like Tormenting Voice to do it, but there are ways to, to reanimate big creatures in red-black too. So Rise Again just seems like more of a fun card than just a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two. and I already have three creatures at 2-mana, and I'm hoping to just pick up a bunch of Magmuts. So my two drop slot might be getting pretty full. See what we open in our second pack. So we did get a decent rare with the Glorious Anthem. It is just decent though, so I'm okay with not taking it and moving into white over black. Um, however, it goes really well with Valorous Steed. But I mean, I even think like Swift Response is probably better than Glorious Anthem overall, just because it's a really efficient removal spell. Two mana instant speed destroy any tapped creature. But yeah, this combo is well with a lot of token producing stuff. So we'd want to take some commons like Goblin Wizardry for four mana is an instant that creates two goblin tokens. Definitely would want to pick up more Valorous Steeds, but that's a viable way to try to go here. It's definitely not the worst. So we would be moving out of these and into Valorous Steed Glorious Anthem. Uh... And again, I could just take an Igneous Cur and stick to red here. I think I'm actually going to take Glorious Anthem here. It's a rare. We're not going to be able to play with it as often. And it's pretty early in the format. I'd like to try some new stuff out. Let's play around with this rare here. Perhaps. I mean, it depends on what we get past. If we get past, like, no white cards for the rest of this, then it's not going to happen. Uh, Daybreak Charger is really nice. Two mana for a 3 1. When a creature enters the battlefield, or when this creature enters the battlefield, give plus 2 plus 0 to a creature till end of turn. But there's also Turn to Slag, which can kill pretty much anything. 5 2 creature and destroy all equipment attached to that creature. I'm probably going to take Turn to Slag here. There's very few stuff that it doesn't kill. It doesn't kill, like, Colossal Dreadmaw. So, like, green's really big creatures it can't kill, and blue has a couple really big creatures that it can't kill, but pretty much I'd say like 80% of the cards in the set this card can kill so it's a pretty nice removal spell that you should take highly wow Grook's Uprising I've seen these basically never when I'm in green I just never seen that card but now that I'm firmly not now that I'm red white or red black over here here's a Grook's Uprising saying what's up uh, so now it's a shock or a turn to slag. I'd like to take the earlier one. It combos with the pyreling to give it double strike out of nowhere if I deal damage to my opponent with this. 
Plus, it can just kill an early game creature. Get it out of the way. Definitely a fine card. I like Turn to Slag 2 as well. I just took one last pick. But I'm going to take the Shock first. And maybe we can get that Turn to Slag later. Another Battle Rattle Shaman or a Hellkite Punisher. Or a Valorous Steed to go with Glorious Anthem. Glorious Anthem makes me want Valorous Steed, Battle Rattle Shaman, or Spellgorger Weird more than Hellkite Punisher because Glorious Anthem is much more about spreading out a bunch of smaller creatures than playing one really big scary threat. But Hellkite Punisher is such a terrifying threat. It can... I don't think there's any game I've been in where this can't kill your opponent in at least two swings. Uh, this card is just brutal. I think I'm going to take Hellkite Punisher, even if it doesn't combo as well with our white cards so far. It does combo really well with our black cards, like Rise Again. If we can discard this to a Thrill of Possibility and then bring it back with a Rise Again to get it out for cheaper, that is actually a really nice combo. So maybe this would be a big reason to move back into red-black and try to do a reanimator-style strategy. This would be the pick where I should definitely make that choice because Thrill of Possibility would be to discard that Hellkite Punisher and then bring it back with Rise again, whereas Gale Swooper would be another good card for the red-white deck, just staying aggro, giving a creature flying, sending it in. I think I'm going to take the Thrill of Possibility here. I think that uh, I really like the idea of these reanimator strategies, and it could be a lot of fun to go for that type of deck. So I'm gonna, oops, wrong card. I'm going to try to do that. Now Kinetic Augur might actually be the pick. Scorching Dragonfire is so good, but Kinetic Augur allows us to discard up to two cards, then draw that many cards. So this gives us another sacrifice, well, another discard outlet to get things into the grave to rise again if we can pick up more of those. Scorching Dragonfire is going to be better overall most of the time, but Kinetic Augur really goes with the weird kind of strategy I'm trying to do. So I am going to take that. And now Carrion Grub is basically perfect, mills us four cards when it comes into play, and it has power equal to the greatest power among creatures in your grave. So this is perfect with big stuff like Hellkite Punisher that we're trying to throw into our grave to bring back with Rise again, or we can even just throw it into our grave to make this a 6-5 for four. That's also good. So definitely now what we're looking for above anything else would be big black and red creatures. And more copies of Rise again. We can't obviously go into a reanimator strategy and have one reanimator card. Then we'd be more about just a red black aggro. Uh this pack's not great. The shrine can be okay. If we get the black shrine, the black shrine's also okay, and if we get both they'd be good. Maybe Village Rites is best. I don't know. I'm going to try out this Shrine for now. It does fill out the curve the best because we have like nothing at three mana. Definitely going to take another Kinetic Augur. Another tur Ooh, but this 8-6? See, I mean, that's really good with Carrion Grub and uh, Rise Again. But I don't know. I feel like Turn to Slags were so much less likely to see. We might see a Gloom Sower just like last pick. Because, I don't know, I feel like people never take those. And see what I'm talking about? No one took this Gloom Sower, so it's going to go right into this deck. And now we're just going to take this card, because why not? I don't want to play against white, blue, flying nonsense. Let's just not let somebody get that with only, like, three cards left in the pack. Okay, so I don't know how I feel about this deck. <laughs> we only have one Rise again. We do have three ways to discard. Actually, can this discard creatures? No, just lands or shrines. So yeah, we have three ways to discard. We have one Thrill of Possibility and two Kinetic Augur. So all we really need is a couple more Rise again and maybe one or two more big things to go with our Bone Pit, Bone Pit Brute, uh, Hellkite Punisher, and Gloom Sower. Uh, for now, we have nothing along those lines in this pack. There's literally one card in this entire pack that I would want to play in this deck, and that is Fetid Imp. So Fetid Imp is the choice. All right, another Battle Rattle Shaman certainly interesting. Obsessive Stitcher is kind of the signpost card for the reanimator strategy, but obviously it's blue-black. It's supposed to be blue-black reanimator, not red-black. I have made things all weird and wrong here, uh, as I usually do. Uh, but we can take Battle Rattle Shaman, 
We can take Pitch Burn Devils, Peer into the Abyss. Uh, if you can cast this card and not die the next turn, it's really hard to lose, because then you just have so much card advantage. So I'd like to try that out. I mean, it's a crazy card. It's a weird card. It's explosive. I'm just going to try it. We'll see what happens. Uh, here I'm going to take an Onaki Ogre just to get another three drop, because I don't have a lot of those. Another Carrion Grub. Don't mind if I do. We have four more... I guess we have five more packs where we could possibly see another rise again. I think just one or two more rise agains here, and I think this deck looks really fun. Because then we have two carrying grub that'll mill us four when they come into play. We have kinetic auger to discard two cards. We have thrill of possibility to discard one card, and then we've got gloom sower, hellkite punisher, and bone pit brute to try to bring back with rise again, or just to make our carrying grubs big. So let's really hope to see a rise again in these next packs. Definitely another Hellkite Punisher. Come on, rise again. Or it's pick five now, so we have three more packs. Three packs to go, come on. Rise again. There's no rise again in this pack. There's no rise again in this pack. There's another Gloom Sower. Not gonna pick that here, just gonna pick another uh, Warmonger. Cause now we have four big stuff. We got two Hellkite, a Gloom Sower, and a Bone Pit. All right, two more packs where we could possibly see a rise again. It does not look like it's going to happen, unfortunately. We'll just have that lone copy. Here's our literal last chance because we've seen every other pack. Nope. Nope, the hope was, uh, was too strong. Let's see, how many dogs and stuff do I have? I've got one dog. That's the only thing I could put counters onto. So, not an Animal Sanctuary deck. I do think those decks do exist in Limited, uh, but it's just going to be another Dire Fleet Warmonger. If people are just going to keep feeding us Warmongers, I guess we'll keep eating them up. I'm very sad with how this deck ended up. It still looks like a good deck. Uh, it's just not as synergistic as I had hoped. But, man, it has very strong late-game bombs. And it's rare, but it can cheat one out, potentially. So, this will be a fun deck. In the worst case scenario, it'll be a fun way to lose if we do lose. I mean, I also think that we have like three turn to slag, a shock, two scorching dragon fire, and just a decent curve. Like... This deck isn't going to just fall apart because we didn't live the reanimator dream. It's just not going to be as crazy. Or not going to be crazy, period. It's just going to be okay. So I still have to cut five cards here, which is kind of crazy. I'm going to turn off this card style. I do not like having one random card style. Gotta cut five cards. How many instants and sorceries do I have for stuff like Kinetic Augur? Got one shock, two dragon fire, thrill of possibility, three turn to slag and a rise again. That's like eight instants and sorceries. Nine if you count Peer into the Abyss. So, I mean, Kinetic Augur could be like a, a three four sometimes. This really only has to be a 2-4 for it to be okay, because you can also just discard lands when you're hitting the late game. If you draw this off the top, it's a pretty good draw. I think we take out Pyrling, because we only have the one Magmut and one Shock, so we're not comboing with Pyrling often. Maybe we take out both of them? And we could take out a th Thrill of Possibility, because we only have one Rise again. We don't need to always be discarding these big things to bring them back with Rise again. For that same reason, maybe I take out a Gloom Sower. I do like the the thought of milling one with a Carrion Grub and then just having an 8-5 for 4 mana. I mean, that's just cool as hell. I think I have to keep that. <laughs> I mean, it's so rare. It's probably not going to happen, but... Just, just think about Magical Christmas Land. Just think about it. Um... I'm definitely keeping Rise again in, because at the absolute worst, like... I could even just draw it late game and bring back Kinetic Augur to draw more cards. This is so weird. This is like the slowest red-black deck I've ever seen. 
We're definitely trying to use Shock and Dragon Fire to stave off our opponent's early threats. Fetid Imp as well to have Death Touch and stuff, and then we're just saving up to play all these really expensive cards. Hopefully overwhelm them with just a lot of big things. For that same reason, I don't think Battle Rattle Shaman really fits in this deck. Because, I mean, what are we doing early? Not a lot. I think the correct choice might be to take out a Bone Pit Brute. It combos the least with Carrion Grub. Um, I don't see a lot of situations where that plus four is going to be super helpful. I would prefer the Punishers and the Gloom Sower. And, you know, normally I would love to keep all of those in if I had multiple Rise Agains, but with just the one Rise Again, I think it's okay to just have just have three really big bomb creatures and just the ones that combo the most well so this deck looks pretty awkward but we'll have to see how it plays because until you play a game or two with it at least for me until i play a game or two with it i can't really assess how well the deck worked out i just haven't reached that level in limited play i haven't reached mythic unfortunately i've only made it to diamond tier two last month when trying to hit mythic all right, here we are in game one. I'm going to keep this hand. It's definitely awkward, doesn't have a lot of early game plays, but our deck in general doesn't have a lot of early game plays. We'll need to draw one land to be able to cast everything in this hand, and we don't have to draw that land until turn five, because we already have all the mana we need by turn four. So I think this hand has a lot of potential, especially if our opponent's on a slower deck, which it does look like it. That's a Thornwood Falls into a Temple of Epiphany. So tapped lands and then a defender. So this match could work out pretty well. However, we still have not drawn the single land we need. We're getting close to needing it. Now we've drawn it. Now we're super safe because we've got Carrion Grub into double turn to slag and pitch burn devils. If we keep drawing land, that would obviously be ideal for a little bit so we can hit our Hellkite Punisher. Unfortunately, our Carrion Grub has milled no creatures, but has milled our thing to get creatures back. So that was about as worse of a mill as we could possibly get. Literally just <laughs> worthless. You're worthless, Carrion Grub. Get out of here. Um, I can turn to slag that crab if it really annoys me, or I can just drop a pitch burn devils. I think I'll just drop a pitch burn devils. Don't really need to deal with that crab because my only creatures that I'd be attacking with on the ground are a 3 3 right now and a 0 5, but obviously not going to attack with a 0 5 until I get another creature in my grave. Probably gonna try to just Hellkite Punisher here. Teferi might just kill me. I mean, this that's a mythic rare time. planeswalker bomb. That does happen. So, I mean, I feel like this is the kind of hand that would have been likely to win a long game. However, Teferi is pretty exceptional at winning a long game as Planeswalkers are in general, there's just the kind of effect that snowball out. The longer they're on the field, they just keep getting bigger and bigger and more powerful and really taking control of the game. So we just have to do everything in our power to possibly get rid of Teferi. I think I want to just play the Imp and the Warmonger. Could use Warmonger to sacrifice Pitchburn Devils to do three to Teferi. But if I do that, he he just goes to one, so it's still not enough. But I can do that next turn if I surprise them with that out of nowhere. If I just cast this Imp and then go to combat, maybe they phase out my Devils. They probably don't, but it's possible. All right, they did not phase out my doubles, so Teferi's going to be at five counters, probably. Okay, so now we drop the Warmonger. So... I waited on Warmonger that way, maybe if they thought I had... Well, if they thought I had a pump spell, they were still going to block, because Teferi's more valuable than the Crab. I don't know. I just thought maybe somehow they wouldn't block the Devils, 
or they would choose to phase the devils out. What I was really hoping for was that they would choose to phase devils out, because if they did that, Teferi would be down to one loyalty, then two loyalty during their turn, so then I could Warmonger next turn sacrifice the devils to shoot Teferi for the final bit of damage. But since they didn't choose to phase anything out, Teferi is at six, which is a very healthy total to where even if I sack this Pitchburn Devils, Teferi's still going to be at three. Had I played Warmonger pre-combat, I guess I could have sacrificed Pitchburn Devils immediately to throw it at Teferi, but then obviously they would just choose to plus it and save the crab to block things. Now that they've Scorching Dragon fired the Pitchburn Devils, I just straight up get no value out of its death since they exile it instead of killing it. So I don't even get to damage Teferi. So perhaps for that reason it would have been better to just sacrifice that immediately. So Warmonger can give... Get plus two, plus two, and trample. So if I turn to slag the crab, Carrion Grub's now a two, five. I attack Teferi with all three of these, and Teferi takes... Uh, Teferi takes three minimum. So this turn they might just phase something out. I doubt it. No, that would just be dealing more loyalty damage to Teferi. If they phase something out, it's going to be the Warmonger. Actually, Carrion Grub only cares about my own creatures, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it does. It only cares about my own creatures. So Carrion Grub's still a 0-5, so... I guess we sacrifice Carrion Grub, and then that'll deal three loyalty to Teferi because either they phase it out or they block and take two plus one in the sky. So Carrion Grub isn't really going to do anything else this game. It's going to be a 0-5 for a long time. So it's worth the sacrifice here. At least I'm dealing three damage to Teferi. Even if they choose to phase out, that's just there. I've dealt three damage. Ooh, they're not choosing to phase out yet. Might be choosing it now that I have declared the attack. Or they may be blocking with the vine. If they block with the vine, I do three damage, as I said. Two trample and one in the sky. If they choose to phase out the warmonger, then I will be dealing four, because it'll get minus three from using the ability, and take one more damage from the imp in the sky. Alright, they're going to go ahead and phase out the warmonger. So we put Teferi down to two. Teferi goes back up to three during their turn, which is enough to phase something out during my turn. But if they choose to phase something out during my turn, they would be choosing to sacrifice Teferi to do that. So, Dire Fleet Warmonger should phase in at the beginning of my next turn. Which means if they don't play a creature, Teferi's dead on board. We can finally be out of this mess at the very least. Yeah, Teferi has already given them a lot of value off of these draw and discard, allowing them to loot away the cards that they're not interested in, or they don't need right now, like these two lands that they looted. So, Teferi's definitely served his purpose, even if he dies this turn. Unfortunately, he's not going to die this turn if they've got a 5-7 Hexproof out, because Warmonger cannot get into that, turn to Slag cannot target that, but I can go ahead and throw my Fetid Imp at his face to do one more damage, keep him down to two loyalty. This is just awful all around though, because now they just get to plus him this turn, which puts him back to three loyalty. And during their turn, they get to plus him again, which puts him at four loyalty. Once he's at 4 loyalty, when it goes to my turn, they get to phase out my dragon so that my dragon can't kill him. Then he's still at 1 loyalty after using that ability. However, if they have to phase out the dragon and keep him at 1 loyalty, since he'll be at 1 loyalty, my imp should be able to kill him in the air. If they haven't drawn a flyer or a way to kill a flyer out of the... I don't know, five cards they've drawn out of his draw and discard so far. So we're really hoping they draw Stone Cold Nothing. Because if they draw a single removal spell, they get to remove one of my flyers and phase out the other one. 
If they can't do that, if their only way to interact is to ferry himself, his minus puts him at one loyalty, and I finish him off. So if they don't have any other way to interact with my flyers, I definitely expect... Um, I'm definitely not blocking here, because they've got green and red in their deck. If they have Sure Strike or Titanic Growth, I'll lose the flyer and lose the threat against the fairy. Plus, if they don't play another creature now, I've got even this Warmonger to do damage to Teferi, which is pretty big. But yeah, if they don't draw any other way to defend Terry outside of his own minus three, they'll probably just draw and discard another card during my turn, just get more value out of him at least. Gloom Sower. Okay, so they have not drawn another way to defend Teferi. So if they phase out Hellkite Punisher, as I said before, he goes to one loyalty and just dies. So I don't really expect that. Not gonna sacrifice a creature. However, with a Gloom Sower and a Spined Megalodon on board, now I have to worry about defending myself, and Turn to Slag cannot kill either of those. One has Hexproof and one has six toughness. Whenever it becomes blocked, it also drains me to life. Which is pretty brutal. So I suppose I could attack Teferi with Hellkite Punisher and Warmonger. Then if they phase out Hellkite Punisher and block Warmonger, I can turn to Slag the Sower. But then Teferi's still on the board. If I attack it with all three, I don't think they will block my Warmonger with Gloom Sower. So then I'll be, I'll be taking 13 damage next turn. Oh my god, this is really bad. I do... I do think I just need to kill Teferi, so we'll just send everything at it. And really hope they block Warmonger? I highly doubt that, though, because blocking Warmonger does not save Teferi in any way. You just let Teferi take all this damage, go ahead and use his plus again. There's no reason throwing your 8-6 your into a fight where it could die to a sure strike. Who knows? They could think that I'm bluffing or think that I just really want to kill Teferi. That's certainly a possibility, too. So, yeah, they accept his death, use his plus one rather than even trying to phase things out. Still not blocker step, though, so they could still shove a Gloom Sower up there. They don't. Definitely unfortunate. We're going to go to two. Looks like I'm out of time. Oh my god, I've never heard that before. It's alright, Teferi, you served your purpose. You forced all of my attacks in your direction for the entirety of this game and gave my opponent a bunch of value by letting them loot probably six or seven cards into whatever they needed at the time. Still won them the game overall, even if the Megalodon Gloom Sower combo is what's going to actually finish the game. Alright, Sky Scanner. Hello there. Just a land is not gonna do it. I can't block Gloom Sower or I'll die, because Gloom Sower does two damage when I block it. So yeah, I'm just straight up dead. Turn to Slag cannot possibly kill Gloom Sower now. My only hope was if they had blocked Gloom Sower for some reason. Yeah, uh, there's not much I can do about that. Turn to Slag's a sorcery speed card, so I couldn't even block. I couldn't even have saved something to block and throw Turn to Slag on it. I was considering saving Fetidimp to block in Death Touch, but the thing is, if I just sent the Punisher and the Warmonger at to fairy that would have guaranteed killed gloom sower but then if i got gloom sower killed to fairy would still be on this board and i would be in just as shit of a spot because they could have phased out punisher blocked warmonger and then i could throw turn to slag at the sower to kill it but then i'm sitting there with a fetid imp and hellkite punisher they still have to fairy and megalodon i think either spot there i'm in a losing position we'll go ahead and send a message do as much damage as we can to them but we're incredibly dead on board, thanks to Gloom Sower's ability. Hmm. 
They have a Grasp of Darkness too. Grasp of Darkness, Scorching Dragonfire. So there was really no coming back from this. But that is always the thing that you have to assume. When your opponent loots a lot of cards and they end up discarding cards like Cultivate and Hooded Blightfang, it's because they've got better cards for the situation that you're in, like multiple Grasp of Darknesses and Scorching Dragonfires that they drew off of Teferi. And a finishing blow too. Seems nice. All right, well, that's going to end the first game, but maybe in our next round we can face up against someone who doesn't have a Teferi and maybe play a regular game of Limited rather than one against a Planeswalker. Planeswalkers aren't the most oppressive thing in the universe in the Limited. It's just... They just change the course of the game so much that it just, it, it completely changes what the format's really about when there's a Planeswalker on board. As you can see by that game, like I'm just forced to constantly go at this Teferi and it survived so long any way that it just drew them so many cards. They had a hand absolutely chocked full of incredible removal by the end of that game. So let's get into another match here. See if we can get some better things going with our deck. Maybe at the very least we won't have our Carrion Grub mill our rise again. That was one of the saddest things I'd ever seen. And now we're confirmed to not mill our rise again, because we've got it in hand. Carrion Grub would be a fantastic draw that would fill out this mana curve really nicely. Play Warmonger turn 3, Carrion Grub turn 4, and then rise again on turn 5 on something big? That would be really cool. Opponent starts off with Veto, Thorn of the Dusk Rose. Pretty scary card. Whenever they gain life, I'll lose that much life. And for five mana, they can give all their creatures life like until end of turn. So they can just guaranteed, even if I have infinite blockers, deal damage to me equal to the number of uh, power among creatures they control. So very scary card. However, our opponent did Mulligan. So they only have three cards in hand at this point after playing a Veto and a Witch's Cauldron. We do get to start getting in there with a Warmonger, unless they want to throw a pump spell at it. Looks like that is not happening, at least yet. Alright, five mana at the ready with three cards in hand. They've got enough mana to use Vito's ability, so even if they have nothing else in hand, might as well just attack with them and gain lifelink. Alright, so they probably have something else in hand. They did send in the attack. It is a Rambunctious Mutt. Three... Four, and when it enters the battlefield, they can destroy an artifact or enchantment. Obviously, I don't have an artifact or enchantment, so it's just a 3-4 on this board. Gonna drop down a Pitch Burn Devils. I could sacrifice it if I want to kill Vito, and then I'd get in for five damage. I just don't know how scary Vito is in their deck. On their current board, Vito's not really that scary. So I'm considering just holding off. But sacrificing Pitchburn Devils also makes Warmonger a 5 5 trample, so I get in for 5 damage, put him down to 12. Plus, then I can rise again. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna sacrifice Pitchburn Devils. That gets me in for an attack with Warmonger and makes my rise again active, even if I don't draw into a Carrion Grub or something. Uh, because if I don't draw into a Carrion Grub, it's gonna be a very long time before I'm casting Rise again, so it's just a dead card otherwise. Gotta fuel my graveyard somehow. And now Rise Again is gonna be really good because I can just do the same play and kill Liliana's Devotee. And then I can Hellkite Punisher next turn. That will be absolutely sick. So we wanna kill Liliana's Devotee because at the beginning of their end step, if a creature died, they could spend two mana and make a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token. So over the long game, this 1-2-3 could turn into a bunch more cards. So it's a pretty good 2-3. I think if it were literally any 2-3, though, I would still want to kill it here. Because I just like staying aggressive. I do 5 damage to them again. Or I kill their Rambunctious Mutt. So they're definitely going to sacrifice the Devotee to the Witch's Cauldron now that they have the mana to do that. But now, next turn, if I draw one more land... Oh, I have a land in hand. I am actually 
blind right now, apparently. But next turn, I have Hellkite Punisher. So I think we've got this pretty sealed. They could, of course, have removal for Hellkite Punisher, in which case I wouldn't have it sealed. But the fact that they didn't play removal until just now makes me feel like they probably don't have removal. I feel like they might have just drawn that Grasp of Darkness. We'll certainly find out. They may have just been holding on to removal that could kill any creature because they didn't want to waste it on a 3-3 in case I played something really big like a Hellkite Punisher. We'll definitely see if that happens. If that is what they were doing, it was certainly the right play with a Hellkite Punisher coming out this turn. Because if they don't have the removal immediately, Hellkite Punisher will kill them in one swing, as it tends to do. Alright, this is definitely a swift vengeance. If they're just going to pass, they're not even going to try to attack into it or anything. Just to send a message. Uh, I feel like they've got removal. Well, nothing yet. It's just, uh... It's just happening. They gain one life off of the Witch's Cauldron, so we need to put this at nine. Let's see... If they don't have removal immediately, okay, I was going to say, if they don't have removal immediately, if they have any Swift Vengeance in their deck, that's still not an immediate concession, because you can spend two black mana, sacrifice one of your creatures, gain a life, draw a card, then you have a white and one more untapped, so if the top card of your library is Swift Vengeance, one and a white instant, destroy a tapped creature, you can survive that and then handedly win the game the next turn, but... Uh, Either they didn't have Swift Vengeance in their deck, or they just didn't care at that point. Either way, I'll certainly take it. There's our first win with this red-black kind of reanimatory more than sacrificing deck. Definitely a fun-looking deck, and it's been fun to play, even against that Teferi deck. I've liked the things that were going on in my hand, even if I didn't like our opponent's stuff. Line of War Visionary is going to start things off. Really good card. I'm just going to go ahead and shock it right now so they can't ramp into a 5-mana creature next turn. They do still get to draw that card off of the Line of War Visionary. That is what is so powerful about that card, is even if... It dies immediately. It's doing so much work by just giving you another card. Land Over Visionary is just very, very good. My favorite green common in this set, hands down. Maybe even my favorite green card, period. I don't know. It's just, it's more fun and, and interesting to me than uh, like a... Uh, Elder Gargaroth and stuff like that. They're like really strong green cards in the set. Even Garuk. I just, I don't know. I love Ladder Visionary. It's just very, very nice and limited. So I'm playing Dire Fleet Warmonger before the Kinetic Augur here because I could draw into a really scary big card and do my Rise Again combo. That would be super cool. If I don't draw into one immediately, I am just going to cast Kinetic Augur this turn and probably discard Peer into the Abyss just because there's so much mana. All right, did not draw into a really big card. I could even discard Rise again at this point. No creatures in Grave yet. We're unlikely to draw into a big creature and have something to discard it if I play Canonic Augur first. I could also just play the Magmut. I feel like Augur discarding two and Sensor Sorceries is the best, though. Then I have a 3-4 Trample on this board. I can block all this stuff well. Yeah. We'll play the Kinetic Augur. Definitely discard Peer into the Abyss because it's 7 mana. And uh, Rise again. Okay, I was going to say 2 lands would be the most awkward draw we could possibly have there because then we'd feel really bad about what we discarded, but... We did draw Carrion Grub among the stuff, which is nice. We still don't have any creatures in the grave, but Carrion Grub will mill 4 cards to potentially be something big and scary. Definitely feels bad to have to mill two of our biggest, scariest sorceries, or have to discard them. But certainly off of what we drew off the top, I think it was the right choice. Because we were still pretty far from doing either of those things. 
Of course, with the Carrion Grub out now, we might hit something we could rise again, but still two mana from Pure into the Abyss. We've got a turn to slag at the ready. We could just throw that at the auger. Then I guess we have decent attacks. They have a 3-2 and a 3-2. Yep, two mana to give plus two. So they have two 3-2s to block with, essentially. So if I just turn to slag kinetic auger, I now have a 4-4 trample and a 3-3. I can send in with both. They trade with the 3-3 and take four damage. I could also just drop carrying grub if I'm going for more of a long game thing. I have a second turn to slag backup, so I think I will just go with turn to slag and try to get as aggressive as possible with Kinetic Augur. They could also double block Kinetic Augur if they're scared of it. Oh, they're just going to Titanic Growth? Okay. I mean, I'll trade a uh, trade a turn to slag for a Titanic Growth. That's way better than if they had Titanic Growth during combat to eat one of my cards like a Kinetic Augur. would much rather trade for that before I even get into combat than have that trick at the ready in the future. This is 100% a trade that I'm willing to make. We've reached the point where they have enough mana to pump it three times a turn, so that's basically a 7-2 that I'm trading for any time that they just draw land instead of an on-land card. So 100% taking that trade every time. So now I may do my Carrion Grub. They do have to double block if they want to kill my Kinetic Augur again. I suppose if I turn to Slag now on board, they can't block my Augur well. If this were a mountain, actually, if this were a mountain, I still wouldn't have enough mana to turn to Slag and Magmut, so my calculations, as usual, are slightly off. Uh, let's just get aggressive. Let's just get aggressive. The Grub isn't even guaranteed to be that aggressive of a card. It's basically, it's a 3-5 right now. If I play it and mill nothing but lands or something like that. Right, they're setting back in because they know they're not going to block with the 3-2. Onaki Ogre is definitely not what I want to see because I can trade with my Kinetic Augur. I'd prefer if they didn't do that. Alright, well, I get to play Carrion Grub and something else. Let's see what we mill with Carrion Grub. Come on, mill the 8-5. Ah, it's another Carrion Grub. So it's just going to be the 3 power from our uh, Ogre thing. Or Dire Fleet Warmonger. Hey, it's from the Dire Fleet. This dude's from Ixalan. Heck yeah, that's cool. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I just noticed that. I just read the name. I've read the name before, but never, never put two and two together consciously until now. Definitely play a mag, but ooh, Kinetic Augur works that way, where it has that power in the grave. Apparently. All right, so it actually, since it has five power even in the grave, it checks that. So Carrion Grub is a 5-5. Five five. That's cool. I wasn't sure if it was going to be one of the cards that worked that way or not. Trader's Greed with a Hobble Fiend out is really rude. Now they're just going to kill my Grub. Quite annoying. All right, send those in. trade here and now their field is going to be a 3-2 trample. My field will be a 1-2 flying death touch. So we have reached parity on board. We're basically tied even in terms of life total. 13 to 12. This is as close as a game can get. We've entered the top deck war. Who is the luckier player? Opponent has started off to a good start, getting that Tyranodon. However, it can't attack unless they have another creature out, or if they can put a plus one plus one counter onto it. They need something on their board with four power or more to attack with that. Pitchburn Devils is a fantastic draw that can trade for two of their creatures if they have the right toughness because it could block a Tyranodon and then deal three damage to something else. It's a pretty beautiful draw. See what they drew here. Apparently it's something. Maybe a removal spell. Primal Might? That's awful. That's absolutely terrible. Jesus Christ. All right. So, so far my opponent is winning the luck war handedly. <laughs> yeah. 
If they draw any creature with four or more power, I'm dead. Because that's another land. All right, draw a card off crash through. And of course. Well, as you can see, I think we played pretty well that game. We did a lot of cool stuff. Got some carrion grubs that actually had five power things to kinetic auger and grave of all things. But the board state got into a position where the game would be decided by who is the luckier player, and I will never win in that position. All right, heading into game three. I like this hand a lot. Again, not a lot of like my own action in the early game, but I have the reactive stuff like the Scorching Dragonfire in this game. So I'm super happy with that. And with my opponent starting with a Wall of Runes, they may be on a slower deck as well, which is good. Gives me a little bit of breathing room to draw into my big old stuff like my... Um, my 6-6 six, six dragons. All of that good stuff. See, there he is. Hellkite Punisher, get in here. Would love to cast it right now, but that's just not possible yet. It's just, just four turns away. We'll get there. Patience. See him drawing the lands for him. Just need one more now. So Onaki Ogre having four power is working out pretty well against that four toughness wall of runes. Opponent is on white, blue, and black. So probably some kind of Esper control nonsense. Yep, <laughs> there's Allegiance Judgment. Removal spell right there. So we've seen removal spells, draw spells, and a wall. So this is going to be a match. Definitely not going to spend any of my removal on a 0-4 wall. Here comes an opt. Scrying a card to the bottom and drawing a card. Did not like what they saw. And a wish coin crab. Very defensive deck over here. All right, I'm about two swamps away from casting this, but could be good. Go ahead and turn to slag the wish coin crab while they only have one mana up. So I don't just start taking two a turn. Every turn. Hey, I'm only one swamp away from appearing into the Abyss now. Hellkite Punisher is very likely to get countered, and if it doesn't get countered, it's 100% going to get removed. There's a rewind from our opponent. Again, nothing we can do around, like, do to play around that or do against that. I don't have any other threats to try to get countered. I have one burn spell that doesn't even kill the only creature they had on board. So there was really no playing around the counter there. Just gotta go for it and hope they don't have it in that situation. Which is exactly what we're gonna do with this Peer into the Abyss in the future. I can dragon fire this fight and wanna not take one damage a turn, but I think I'm fine to take one damage a turn for now. Ah, I see that I am dead. Yeah, I mean, red does not really have removal for an 8-8. Uh, my creatures all have to attack because of this pirate. Makes all my creatures attack each combat if able, so I am just dead. Because next turn I have to attack with both my creatures, that means I won't have any blockers for the whale, even though I could potentially spend a shock or a dragon fire to block with the dragon on the whale, but it looks like they have removal as well. Finish the blow coming in. Would have loved to pick up some of those in the draft, but unfortunately, I believe I saw those before I was committed to black. And then just didn't get any after that, unfortunately. I have no possible outs right now. I don't even have the black mana to peer into the abyss. Even if I did, it would just kill me because I'd go to five life and then just die to the whale. It is time for our sadness because that is the one and three one. That is the one and three run with this Rakdos deck that actually looked pretty fun, looked pretty decent, but 
I feel like we did just get pretty unlucky. It definitely was not built perfectly, but I think it deserved more than a 1-3 run. Running up against the Teferi was pretty rough. And then the other game where we lost because we got into a top deck war. And now uh, this game, we're just kind of getting brutalized by this Esper control deck. This game hasn't been particularly unfair. We just... Uh, <laughs> we're just getting slaughtered by a better deck here. A turn to slag is not eight damage. I mean, it is also just a, a bomb that our deck does not have good removal for. Our colors do. If we had managed to pick up any of the finishing blows in black, we could have dealt with this pursued whale. But while we do have a lot of removal in this deck, it is all of this red damage based removal, so we just could not deal with this whale. And the sad thing is, too, the sad thing is, if I hadn't have uh, kind of just given up on killing the whale and uh, shot that shield mate there, I would still have a Scorching Dragonfire in hand. I could throw a Dragonfire and turn to slag at the whale to kill it this turn, uh, but even doing that, this would be forced to attack, and then I would be at one life from taking one more damage from the 1-3. So even if I had done that, it would have been nice to be able to kill the whale in that situation. But I would then have to attack into the Wishcoin Crab, my 1-1 one, one would die, and then Wishcoin Crab would put me at negative 1 life. So... It is worth pointing out, though. Definitely didn't play ideally in that situation. Because... I should have realized, my deck is full of turn to slags. So even though I'd already used one, if I had kept this Scorching Dragonfire in hand, a Scorching Dragonfire plus turn to slag would kill the whale, if they didn't have another creature to follow it up with, I would have at least survived off of... Oh my god! I'm just gonna stop talking. And we're gonna wrap up this draft now. So, thank you all for watching this Corset 2021 premiere draft with an interesting red-black deck that didn't... didn't exactly pan out. I'm going to go ahead and open the prize packs that we get. I believe it's just one prize for going one and three. We can at least see what kind of cool stuff we got for our collection. Definitely got some decent stuff for the collection just in the draft itself. Peer into the Abyss is definitely interesting. Going to be a lot of fun in Brawl and Historic Brawl for sure. Let's see, our one win prize is 100 gems and a pack. Let's see what we get here. Open it right up. Come on. What do we got? Brash Taunter. This card is really strong and limited. This card's really fun in general to play with. It's certainly a big downer to play against. It's not very fun to play against unless you have the right removal for it. It always feels incredible when your opponent plays a Brash Taunter and then you have something that just exiles it so the indestructible doesn't matter or something that gives it minus four, minus four, like a Grasp into Darkness so indestructible doesn't matter. But other than that, if you're playing against like a red-green deck or or like a, a friggin' black-red deck with just damage-based removal and destroy-based removal. This card's so hard to beat because it makes attacking on the ground basically impossible because you can just block and then deal damage to them based on what you blocked. And then you can just start sinking your mana into that fight ability and fighting their biggest creature every turn, or even your own biggest creature every turn, to get that dedicated damage to your opponent from Brash Taunter's effect. So really good limited card. Could be interesting and constructed. I've never tried it in anything and constructed, but certainly pretty good pack to end the video on, even if the games were not that great. So again, thank you everybody so much for watching another premiere draft here on my channel. If you'd like to see more, just stick around. There will be more coming in the next few days. I'm really bad at keeping a schedule, but I am filming a lot of drafts right now on this day. So if you're watching this one, there'll be one tomorrow. So. Again, thank you all for watching. If you want to see me live, check me out on Twitch. If you want to see more of this, subscribe, like, comment, all the good stuff. And I'll see you again very soon for more Magic Arena content.